Right, welcome back. Uh, you're focused on the world of mining today, and this is the subject of the latest uh, New Age Business Briefing brought to you by the SABC and today very kindly sponsored by JIC Mining. And uh, our third guest has arrived, uh, Clive Ramatibele smith Thank you very much indeed. Always a pleasure yeah. uh, to have you with us. I'm going to ask you sort of a market question in a short while. Yeah. But before that, I'd like to go to uh, Lumkom Timde, who's the former CEO of uh, the MDDA. Uh, just to get a sense of how the media has been covering uh, the mining sector, Part of uh, life is, are things real or are they perception? And has the media been reporting our situation fairly? Has it been wanting? Uh, just a few thoughts from you, uh, Mr. Mtinde. Good morning and thanks, Peter. Um, one of the worries in terms of the reporting has been the inaccuracies as you have heard from the minister the facts about even the role played by the Guptas in the mining industry the stakes they hold but it's reported in the media as if you're talking about a huge role played by the Guptas and therefore um, uh, the minister's uh, biasness to, 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 to them but also there's quite a number of uh, facts that have been challenged uh, post the reports that we saw in the Sunday Times. And there is even a case that is before the press ombudsman. But that speaks to uh, the challenges that we're facing in our media in terms of the, the, the degeneration. And I think we really need to um, uh, up our socks in that regard and have effective independent regulation so as to really minimize those kind of inaccuracies. Because there's a code for the profession mm. that really imposes that reporting must be accurate, at least factually. They can express opinions to whatever direction they want to express opinions, but the facts of matters must be factual and accurate. And that is the worrying factor. Okay, thank you very much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. I know we've got members of the media here today. Perhaps uh, they might want to comment on that. Uh, all right, so I'm jumping around quite a bit, but let's get uh, a sense of what our audience here is thinking and also you at home, and then I'm going to uh, get some comments from uh, Clive just now. Um, table number six, we'll find uh, Tabo Shokhole. Table number six. Good morning, Minister DG. And... Um everybody here. Um, the first thing I want to commend the minister on two issues. That is continuity of the programs that have been there because a number of years have been spent in ensuring that we get somewhere as the sector and it's encouraging to hear that there's continuity rather than you having your new pet projects. And uh, secondly I want to um, commend the fact that also the acting DG is somebody that is highly respected in the industry um, comes with a wealth of experience that is also encouraging because it also ensures continuity in what we're doing however um, industry complains about inconsistency in the law there is no such a thing the law is very clear the law has been there the very same people who want to keep on renegotiating are the ones who create that inconsistency or uncertainty in the law the law there's a mining charter which has got targets that must be implemented. And to even prove further to industry that the law is there, it is up to government to make sure that there are punitive measures that are available in the Act that should be applied to companies that do not comply with the mining charter. We've got a problem in our country of unemployment, um, a problem of lack of transformation. And those two put together, they put our country on a very slippery slope. And if that is not addressed, we are in for, for big problems. Having said that, my one is to say, does the minister think will there ever be a day where we see a resource bank, a resource bank that would assist black entrants to enter the market, not at the bequest or um, on the back foot of industry and right uh, 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 um, monopoly capital because our government does have tools at its disposal. One of those, in conjunction with Treasury, there could be 
quantitative easing measures that force these very same companies that are hoarding loads of cash to release those cash um, 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 reserves into the economy and applying measures such as negative interest rates where black people can get preferential uh, 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 rates or soft loans and enter the market. Will we ever see that, Minister? And how soon do you think that can be done? Okay, Minister. <coughs> now, <coughs> let me welcome the question, Peter, and say the coming Indaba that starts on Sunday is going to look at ways and means of reviving this industry, as we have said earlier on. And part of the revival of the industry is uh, what the uh, previous speakers mentioned, uh, black economic empowerment. We are going to look at ways of how do we enable them not to depend on other uh, role players, but also give them enough resources that will make them to become black champions moving forward. I'm sure after the Indaba, we'll be able to put up a number of proposals on the table. We are a government that engages with people. We'll, we'll then engage with all the interested stakeholders and see that see if we can move forward together as a collective the issue that always comes up is you can come up with charters you can come up with laws and rules but what happens to people that are not compliant what is going to be the view of how you deal with people that don't comply with the mining chart well it's 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 so simple Peter, let me say the, uh, the charter as we speak is, is under review. We are anticipating that we should be ready with it around uh, the end of April. We are engaging with stakeholders. Once we have agreed with the contents of the charter, it is our work as government to then begin to enforce what we are agreed upon. That is why from time to time you'll find that there will be some tensions between uh, the department and our stakeholders. It's because at some point our interests will differ. We want to emancipate. On the other side, they want to uh, maximize their profit. We understand, but we are going to be firm and ensure that uh, what we have agreed on becomes a reality. Okay, all right. Will people lose licenses if they don't comply? Well, there, there is a policy that is, I found it there. I'm happy with it. I'm not going to change it, but I'm going to enforce it. Use it or lose it. Okay. That's going to be a quote, you know that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, table number nine, and then I'm going to come to you, Clive. Yep. Uh, Sidiko uh, uh, Rakulote. Uh, thank you. The Freedom Charter talks about the mineral wealth being transferred to the hands of the people as a whole, meaning all the citizens. There have been demands from certain communities where they want job opportunities to be reserved for the communities around the mine. Don't you think, Minister, that promotes regionalism or strategic exclusion from other citizens who are not closer to the mines? Thank you. Okay. I don't know. Maybe Acting DG, you can address that, and, and Minister, you can add as well. Communities upon which they've been there for centuries, uh, it's their resource. Surely they should be first pick in terms of benefiting from the resources coming up from their ground? Well, uh, as, as, as he articulates it, the mineral resources of South Africa belongs to all the people of South Africa, including those that are near those mineral resources. That should be the understanding. Once we know that there are mineral resources in a particular area, that fact alone does not begin to say 
that particular area has an exclusive right to these mineral resources. It means the people of South Africa still must enjoy these mineral resources, but not forgetting, of course, that these people that have been there for all the time should also reap a benefit of uh, being closer to these mineral resources. It's a question of balancing uh, the interest and ensuring that those people that are nearer the resources do not think that they and they only are entitled to those resources. Okay. I, I don't know if you want to add to that or, or not. Okay. All right. Um, I, you know, there's so many places I want to jump around to, but M Mr. Malifa, you're here, um, the CEO at ESCOM, and I, let's just uh, maybe ask you a couple of questions, if I could get a microphone to you. Um, the first is, Chamber of Mines is really worried about the uh, tariff hike that you want to uh, get, because that will put a sector that's already under pressure even under even more pressure. Your thoughts on that? I think the tariff hike puts the entire economy, not just the mm. Chamber of Mines, uh, uh, under pressure. And we are cognizant of that, um, especially the impact of the tariff increase on the poor. And uh, it is our hope that when um, the, uh, the regulator finally makes a determination, they will take the special circumstances of the poor into consideration and implement it in such a way that uh, the poor are um, protected against the tariff hike. But it is also important to say that um, this particular application relates to 2013 um, um, tariff increase that was given then. You remember that in 2013, ESCOM's tariff application was 25%. And um, the question was whether to bite the bullet then or bite it later. And the regulator decided to give us 8% at that time. And it would be remiss of us to pretend as if um, we, there are no mechanisms to claw back and actually come back and show that there was some merit in what ESCOM was saying in 2013. And so that is the problem that we find ourselves in. The problem was postponed. And I don't know if this time the regulator will postpone it again, and it will be unfortunate if that happens. All right. With your permission, I just want to ask you a couple of more questions. Uh, coal has come up uh, in, in the media a lot. It's as if coal is the new gold, actually. Uh, and this is one of your resources that uh, you employ in keeping uh, your, your plants going. Um, I'm just wondering why there's such a wide discrepancy in terms of pricing from your different suppliers. Uh, for instance, I've seen Exara's Arnott Coilery coal price, they say projected for 2016, is 1,369 rands per tonne uh, delivered, and that's compared to, for example, uh, Thagisa's uh, price of 418 rand. How do we have such a huge variance in what suppliers are delivering the same product uh, to, to you for? Part of the problem is that ESCOM used to have this, uh, or still has, this cost plus mines. Mm -hmm. And the arrangement was that um, ESCOM would um, finance the uh, capital expenditure of the mines that supplied with coal. Now what we have said recently is that, uh, and that is what actually made um, coal expensive to us because then you get tied to these mines in which you have invested the capital. Uh, um, and um, what happened in uh, Arnott, we had a 40-year contract with a cost plus mine in which we had put in the capital expenditure. But the price is 900 rand and the, and the contract came to an end. And when the contract came to an end at 900 rand, we then said to uh, Exaro, we cannot afford to pay 900 if we can get the coal for 400 elsewhere in the market. And we then agreed to short-term supply agreements where we are procuring coal at 400. But if we were to renew 
the Exaro um, contract, it would actually, with the cost plus, it will come to 1,396, not 69, 96. Mm. Um, because that 33 rand is also matters. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, and so, um, and but we have not said to Exaro that you are. Uh, we will not talk to you. You are out of the uh, picture. We have said let's open it up to a tender process. And so we are currently adjudicating a tender, Exaro, and the mine is welcome to tender for the new coal supply contract. We have made it clear that we are not interested in the cost plus arrangement and that the prices that we are showed must be competitive. I think we owe it to South Africa, to the regulator, to show that we are trying to reduce the costs of primary energy so that two or three years down the line, we don't come back here asking for another 25% increase. All right, so then the other issue is, I believe you're paying penalties uh, to people like Exaro uh, for some of the delays that you've experienced at uh, Madupi. And the, the amounts that I'm seeing here, five to six billion maybe even in the future. Uh, tell us about these deals. How do we get caught up in a situation where you've got a delay in uh, building one of your plants and now you're stuck with these penalties in the billions? What happened at uh, Midupi was that uh, when the project started, ESCOM signed a take or pay agreement in which they agreed that uh, at the time when the project is estimated to complete, it will take coal from Exaro. And Exaro said, well, we are going to start um, sinking a mine to supply you with the coal, but you have to take the coal, and if you don't take it, you must pay for it. Mm -hmm. And so we have not paid, so in terms of that agreement, there are penalties that need to be paid because the, the project was then delayed. But the penalties have not been paid. What we have done in the past is we have made a provision for to pay the penalties, and if you calculate what the penalties would be, they would come to about five or six billion. But in discussion with the executive committee and the board of ESCOM um, currently, recently, what we have decided and have encouraged um, the managers in that area to do is not to pay the penalties, but to buy the coal and stockpile it. Because if you pay the penalties, it's a deadweight loss. Mm -hmm. So we are buying that coal from Exaro, we're not paying them the penalties, and we will stockpile it. And we will use it when Midupi is ready, as Midupi gets ready. But also, we will also use it in the other mines um, to deal with the issue of uh, uh, supply tension, the, the issue of price. Because if we can show that actually we have other sources of supply, uh, we can actually uh, help to reduce the price of coal. So, uh, yeah, there is talk about penalties, but we have not paid any penalty. There had been a provision, and we are going to write down that provision because we are actually taking the asset, putting it above ground, and stockpiling it. All right, and one final question. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Um, there was, when uh, I remember at the, the height of the um, uh, blackouts, load shedding, a big question was raised around some big mines, industrials, that were given preferential um, tariffs in terms of what they need to pay for electricity compared to consumers, regular consumers like me. Where are we with that? Does that still exist? Is that something that's being addressed? Yes, there are certain parts of industry that have a differential tariff uh, to promote uh, investment. But the tariffs are set by the regulator. And as I say, even the 17.6, it does not mean that um, the regulator will apply it across the board to everybody. Uh, it is the discretion of the regulator on uh, uh, how tariffs are set and who pays what. Uh, ESCOM does not make uh, pricing decisions. The pricing decisions are made by the regulator. What we know is that we need on average, an increase of about 17.6%, but it is up to the regulator to decide from where it will come. It doesn't have to come from everybody uh, equally. Okay, all right, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Malifa. Table number 17, TJ Stradom.
table 17. Morning, Minister. Um, TJ from uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, th there's a lot of job cuts looming in the mining sector, and um, you've spoken about it before, but um, in what ways will government intervene to, to prevent uh, job cuts in the centre, and what has happened to the jobs compact from, uh, from last year uh, that, was, that was signed by your predecessor? Okay. <coughs> no, I have alluded to the fact that um, 2016 is going to be a hectic year uh, in terms of action. That will include job losses. We are awaiting a number of um, announcements to that effect, but we are following the uh, agreement as, as said by, by um, the person who has just asked a question. We have also roped in CCMA to streamline uh, our action uh, to ensure that we deal with this issue holistically. Uh, there are mechanisms, there are 10 points that we have agreed on that will help us move on and cushion the impact of job losses um, during this hectic period. The issue of sterilization of mines that we have said we are against is part of the compact. That will also allow us a new entrance to the mines and that may actually save a number of jobs as we have seen with the case of Optimum Coal and Tegeta where 3,000 jobs were at stake but because of the engagement we're able to um, uh, avoid job losses. We are engaging with uh, these right holders uh, and with the hope that uh, something will come out of uh, this crisis and I'm sure we'll be able to minimize the impact. All right. Just before we take the break, Clive, um, we've been chatting a little bit about the state of play, uh, reviving the sector. And I guess next week at the Mining Endeavour, we've got uh, international community investors uh, with their eyes on the South African <coughs> mining sector. And I'm just wondering, what are they coming here with? What thoughts do they have? What are they seeing? And is there anything that we can do from, I guess, someone who's observing the big picture um, that can help Minister and DG to make South Africa more attractive and perhaps even save uh, the sector? It's a very, very good question indeed, I think, um, Peter. But what's important to remember is that the government has done a lot to try and attract many investors uh, globally to come to our mining sector. I think the biggest challenge, obviously, in our, in our, and this is why that gentleman's question is so relevant, is that how do you stabilise uh, and make sure that we don't have job losses? And because uh, it seems like the quickest way for miners, for mining companies to get out of a problem is to cut down jobs. And perhaps maybe we must look at a way to get a balance there to say, well, you know, you can't always make profits and then all of a sudden when there's a global crisis, the first thing that you think of is actually uh, getting people out of work because that is a problem in South Africa. So we need to start thinking how do we balance that. The second thing that I know a lot of people will be looking uh, towards the Indaba is to finding out stability within the context of the mineral resources sector. I think we have done really, really well. Uh, over the years. I think there are still issues that are teething issues that need to be aligned. For example, beneficiation. Um, and I heard a gentleman ask about the communities in which these mining companies are mining and, and getting their resources from. The, the, the problem is, is that mining companies um, post-94 have done very little in actual fact within the communities in which um, they're mining from. If you look at the case of Marikana, for example, um, you have there people from from Kwakwa, you have people from uh, the Eastern Cape who are in that area of the Northwest. Um, and their living conditions are really dire. And we need to start asking ourselves, how could these people actually continue to live under such dire situations? So the, it's the responsibility, it's not just of government, it's the responsibility of the mining company to make sure that it ma uh, makes it. I remember in Pumalanga, for example, if you look at the mining sector there, if you look at the mining companies and what they did there, um, you know, they used to build, before even starting to work, uh, property for miners to actually stay in. So these are the things that worry me. 
Um, but I think international investors, when they come in here, it mustn't be something to take advantage of the resources. It's how do we build a South Africa that we'll all be happy what, with. What questions will he be putting to Minister? The, the investors, when they come, what are they going to be wanting to know from, from, from South Africa? Well, the one thing that is very firm and it's part of the National Development Plan is, is empowerment issue um, because we can't not have power over the resources that belong to this country. So even when we have, we are inviting external investors to come in, we have to still remain having control because that's how every country in actual fact drives on, on its economy. That's the first thing. The second thing I would ask is, what is the long-term goals? You know, what happens, what risk uh, 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 management tools are they going to put in place when there is job losses, when there is uh, uh, problems with, the, with electricity? I think that is the biggest question, actually, is to making sure that the lights are on yeah. for them to actually continue doing business. But most importantly, is to sustain uh, the jobs within which uh, are created in the mining sector. All right, okay, we'll get some comments on that after the break and uh, look at Twitter and also hear from Carlos Andrade and Muzwanele Mani after this. Stay with us.